so much for joining us for today's session. I think we're going to get started now. So thank you all for joining us today for this information session, Summer Abroad England Virtual Program. We're happy to have you here joining us today to learn more about Summer Abroad and about the England Program. My name is Jennifer Ben. I'm one of the program coordinators for the England Program, and uh, I'm coordinating the English and Psychology courses this year. I have my colleague and co-host Genevieve with me. Hi, I'm Genevieve Steidman. I'm um, one of the other program coordinators. I'll be managing the criminology and the history courses. Before we continue, although we're not all in the same space physically together, I wanted to take this opportunity to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting is still a home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Here's our agenda for today's session. I'll start with some introductions to let you know who else is on the webinar and who you'll be hearing from today, provide you with a general overview of what Summer Abroad is, and then we'll just dive right into the details of the Virtual England program for 2021. This is where we'll invite our instructors to share more about their courses with us. Then Genevieve is going to take over to cover details on how to apply, the costs, as well as the next steps. There will be opportunities for you to ask any questions you have throughout the session. You'll notice on your screen there's a Q&A button that you can click, type in your questions to submit to us. You're welcome to submit your questions at any point during the session, and we'll answer them either during the session or at the end of the formal presentation. One thing I also want to note is about our Zoom webinar setup today. So it may look a little different to other Zoom meetings that you've been in. As participants, your cameras and microphones will remain off and the chat function is disabled. So you'll mainly be watching us do our presentation. And the best way to engage with us if you have any questions is to submit them through the Q&A function. Also, this session is being recorded. Uh, we'll be sure to send you the link to access the video in case you want to watch it again, refer back to any of the information that we share today. We'll start with introductions. In addition to Genevieve and myself, we also have two of our colleagues with us, Adam and Anastasia, who also work at the Summer Abroad office. They're working behind the scenes to make sure everything is running smoothly, and they'll also be helping us answer questions through the Q&A function. As well, we're very grateful to have our instructors join us today, Professor Catherine Williams, Professor Stuart Kamensky, Dr. William Watson, and Professor Timothy Sale. They'll each get a chance to speak about their course, and at the end of each instructor's presentation, you'll be invited to ask uh, any questions to them. So now we'll actually get started. So we'll start with what is Summer Abroad? So our office, we coordinate U of T courses that take place during the summer months, and they run between three to six weeks. Students who complete a Summer Abroad course earn a full year wide credit. So they're considered immersive condensed courses. Since a full year course normally takes about four months to complete during the summer term, these courses are condensed into three to six weeks. The class sizes are small, so they range between 18 to 30 students. And that gives you an opportunity to really get to know your classmates and your instructor. Because summer abroad courses are U of T courses, they'll show up on your transcript just like any other U of T course you take. Lots of students uh, take summer abroad courses to fulfill their program requirements, as well as any breadth and distribution requirements they need to graduate. These courses are also taught by U of T faculty, and in some cases by our international faculty at our partner institution. Again, because the class is small, you have the opportunity to work very closely with your professor and your colleagues in class. Summer abroad courses are unique in that they are designed to include experiences like virtual field trips, guest speakers that allow you to connect with the course content. So you're really experiencing what you learn. And also because you're connecting with like local experts and speakers who are abroad gives you that international perspective of the course content you're learning. So as you may know, this year, because of the ongoing pandemic, uh, we're unfortunately not able to offer our summer abroad courses like we used to in the past with the travel component. So instead, we've modified our course offerings offerings to become virtual this year. And you may be wondering why you should take a virtual course. Well, there are certainly some benefits to taking a summer abroad virtual course. Certainly in terms of cost, it's not as expensive since there's no travel involved. You don't need to worry about paying for travel and living arrangements. And it gives you the flexibility to be able to take the course wherever you like. And then compared to other U of T virtual courses, the virtual summer abroad courses are unique because they give you the opportunity to connect with the guest speakers and local experts abroad which really help build your network. It's a chance to get to know more about these international destinations from the comfort of your own home. So you'll get to learn about the culture, you get to interact with the locals, 
and that can help prepare you or even get you excited about wanting to travel there one day when it's safe to do so again. Maybe you're considering graduate studies abroad. So this could be an opportunity to get to know the destination and whether it's a good fit for your education. And because the class sizes are small, you get you really get to know your classmates well. So lots of students in the past have told us they've made lifelong friends. They got to collaborate very closely together during their summer abroad experience, which has really helped improve their communication and presentation skills. So again, and summer abroad courses are structured differently compared to other virtual courses at U of T. So for the England program in particular, it's a full year course condensed into four weeks. So it is quite immersive. Classes will be taking place four days a week from Monday to Thursday. And this allows you to focus on only one course at a time. So allowing you to really dive deep into the course content you're learning. Because of this, we don't recommend you take other courses at the same time because you will need to be present for your summer abroad course. Attendance for all online lectures and the virtual activities that are prepared for the course are mandatory. That's something to keep in mind when you're thinking about summer abroad. You'll also need to make sure you have a computer with a webcam and microphone, as well as reliable internet access so that you're able to fully participate in the course and really get the most out of it. So I'll pause here for a moment to see if there are any questions that I can answer at this time. There's one question here. Will the summer abroad courses be the same cost as other full year summer U of T courses? So we do have the cost that's listed on our website. If you take a look through the programs and looking at the cost, you can go to, um, there's a panel where it says there's a cost section. So you can take a look at what the costs are. The cost for the programs, they're definitely cheaper than the normal courses that we take for in terms of travel, but they will be slightly more expensive compared to other U of T virtual course, mainly because it does take some time to really make the arrangements for some of the virtual field trips and the guest speakers. So with those arrangements, there is a little bit of an added cost to it. There's another question here, are the class times synchronized? So again, you will be, it is mandatory for you to attend classes. So I believe most of the instructors will be expecting students to sign on at the time of the class. Each instructor may have different schedules. So there may be some asynchronous activities that you'll be required to do. Each instructor will give more details about their course. But in general, we do expect students to be participating in the classes synchronously at the time of the scheduled class. I'll move on now. Here is an overview of the courses that we're offering for the England program. And at this time, I'll be inviting each instructor to speak about their course. We'll be inviting them to talk about their course. I know some instructors have prepared slides that will help us follow along. And um, at the end of each instructor's presentation, we'll pause to answer any questions you have. So I do recommend you use this opportunity to ask any course specific questions while we have the instructor here with us to answer them. Some of the instructors will need to leave after they speak. So it would be this would be the best time to get your questions answered by them. So we will start with Stuart Kamensky, the course psychology course special topics in psychology abroad, disability, culture and inclusion. So Stuart, I welcome you to turn on your camera when you're ready. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introductions. Can you all hear me and see me? Yes? Yes. Okay, great. I know I only have uh, usually five minutes and when you ask a prof to talk, um, often they tend to take a lot more time than that. A few words about my course and a few words about myself. Um, so again, my name is Stuart Kamenetsky. I'm a professor of psychology at UTM, director of the psychology undergraduate program. I've been teaching in this field, this area of disability for many years, pretty well 25 years at U of T. While I was an undergraduate student in order to finance my education, I spent about 10 years working in the field, I'm working in child welfare, working with um, individuals who have developmental disabilities, uh, mental health difficulties, uh, traumatic brain injuries. So really, I would say that the, what I bring to this course is like any other psychology course, lots of academic knowledge in a interdisciplinary type of format. Psychology doesn't own the study of disability. There are many different factors that come into this conversation. Um, but I, I also combine that with a lot of today and now experience about how what happens, what, uh, what is the lived experience like for individuals with disabilities, what services are provided to them, and what are the key core issues uh, within this field today from various different um, areas and various different 
perspectives. Classes will meet Monday to Thursday, 9 to 12. Three days of these classes, there will be international presentations. On each one of these three days, we'll have three one-hour presentations from all over the world. I'll be getting into that in a minute. A few certainly in England, but I felt that there's no reason to limit it to England since we're doing this all on Zoom. Three days, which are noted, of course, in the course syllabus. Classes will end at 1.30 so that we have an hour for each, a 15 minute, an hour for each presentation, 15 minute um, Q&A, 15 minute break, and then we'll move on to the next one. So basically throughout this whole class, we're going to deal with one question, one so-called simple question, which as we'll see is not all that simple. And that question is, is disability an inevitable consequence of impairment? Impairment is designed, is, is defined objectively, medically, like a broken arm can be x-rayed, could be scanned, we can see it. Okay, the COVID virus, we could test for it and we know that it's there. But the experiences that sometimes result you know, are not all that straightforward to understand. Uh, the experience might be exclusion, not being able to make friends, and not being able to work, okay, and so on. And really, this course is all about the relationship between these two, trying to understand the factors that really determine whether it's always the case or, or whether it has to be the case that when a person um, has an impairment, they will feel excluded. They may not be able to work. They may not be able to get married. Or is it Rather, other factors like history, like culture, nationality, and other factors, of course, that may actually mediate this association between impairment and the resulting psychological experience of disability. And that's what really lends this course, or what may, I think makes this course interesting, is really taking that type of international perspective so that we try to understand the relation between impairment and disability in different parts of the world. And we'll see that, you know, the medical definition actually really, really falls short in terms of always determining what the disability experience is going to like. So I'd like to move on with a few more slides and just let you know what some of the topics are that we'll be discussing. There's a lot more detail, of course, in the uh, course syllabus, which is available, and you're always welcome to reach out to me. My email address is in the course uh, syllabus, which is available, of course, on the Summer Abroad website. I want to just mention what the nine confirmed pres international presentations are going to be, what the topics will be and so on. So the first it will be UK. It's, it's going to be at the Lang Langdon Down Museum of Learning Disability. This will be about institutionalization of people with disabilities. This is in, just outside of London. And that's where Down syndrome was discovered. And we're going to understand and learn how relatively privileged individuals who had um, children with developmental delays in the UK, they call it learning disabilities. Here we call it developmental delays. What their lives were like living in um, institutions rather than at home. We're going to further discuss institutionalization in Florence, Italy. At the Museum degli Innocenti, that was a place where abandoned children were, you know, had to live. And they were abandoned for many, many different reasons, including because they had disabilities and nobody wanted to look after them. And it's been around for several hundred years, and we're going to learn a lot about the impact of the Catholic Church ensuring uh, that there is a place for these um, abandoned children, including kids with disabilities, to live. We're going to talk a lot about accessibility. So unfortunately, we won't be able to go this year, but I very much encourage you to go. The University of Oxford is an absolutely beautiful place architecturally. Of course, it was built many, many years ago, and the majority of the buildings, of course, are not accessible. And there's a lot of tension between how do we create accessible spaces? How do we ensure that every place at the university is accessible to students, faculty, and staff, consistent with current uh, laws and prevailing attitudes in society, while at the same time restoring and preserving the historical um, integrity of these uh, spaces? We are going to talk about accessibility in the United States. The ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, is the most powerful and most influential disability law in the world. We're going to go to the city of Oakland Park and rec and we're going to find out what they have done. The city of Oakland, California is a, is a complex city with, a, with you know, an inner uh, city population and often political demonstrations and so on. And we're going to find out what they've done in order to deal with the Americans with Disabilities um, Act and guarantee accessibility to individuals that receive services by, you know, by the city. We're going to learn quite a bit about, about deafness and we're going to learn about deaf culture. We're going to learn that deafness is not only medically defined, but it may be cultural 
culturally defined. And we're going to do this in a couple of places. We're going to go to the UK and we're going to hear from a professor of linguistics that, that who is deaf and communicates in British sign language through a sign language interpreter. Um, and we're going to have the experience seeing what that looks like and hearing more about deaf culture. We are going to go to Japan. We all think that Japan is sophisticated and technologically ahead. Very, very interesting over there. They're not that ahead in terms of cochlear implants, though they are very much ahead in terms of deaf culture and sign languages. So we're going to really learn about how Japan has done this differently from uh, the way that we have in Canada and in the West. We are going to talk about vision and we are going to visit a very, very interesting museum um, right in central London, the Museum of the College of Optometrists, and we're going to learn about eyeglasses as a disability image. When somebody wears glasses like myself, right away you know, oh, that person doesn't see well. So in more than anything else, it's kind of raising that flag, hey, I have a disability. Okay, so we'll be learning what that is all about. Um, and then we're going to be looking at a couple of other issues. One has to do with disability support programs. So how do we finance disability? How do we pay for adults who have have disabilities that can't work? Um, how do we support them? There's various different models. The Canadian model and Japanese model are very different from one another. And we're going to talk about these uh, types of differences. And finally, we are going to look at multiculturalism from a different perspective. So we're going to go to Israel that we don't always think of as a multicultural country, but there are Jews and there are Arabs and there are Christians there, and they belong to various different denominations and different levels of religiosity. And we're going to learn about a clinical services and how these are delivered to individuals that belong to different cultures and different communities so that we could compare and contrast that with what we do in Canada. I'd love you to come. The course is certainly accepted for the psych program at UTM. It's accepted for the psych program at St. George. I haven't heard back from UTSC. You should ask the UTSC advisor, but I don't see any reason why not. And again, if you have any questions, you can ask me now and you can email me um, as well and we can have a conversation uh, later on. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer, and for everyone for the opportunity and take care. Thank you, Stuart. Let me just see if there's any questions about your course specifically. I think one thing that maybe students might be interested in learning is if these guest speakers and these site visits are going to be synchronous or are they going to be more like recorded sessions that you watch during class? Thank you. All of the sessions, everything is going to be uh, synchronous. My only concern is the Japanese sessions. They're 14 hours away. So uh, there may be uh, the Jap Japan sessions. We may start at 8 a.m. because 8 a.m. in Japan will be 10 p.m. If we start at 9 a.m., um, then it will be 11 p.m. for them over there. I really prefer having synchronous interactive uh, section sessions as much as possible, especially in a smaller class size it will provide opportunities for questions and answers. Um, in general, in my classes now on Zoom, I really want to have everyone present. I like everybody to have their camera on so that we could see one another and we could as much as possible replace and replicate the experience that one would have in a real life class. So that's very, very important for me for the cohesion of the, um, of the class. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Can you just share briefly what the assignments are going to look like for your course and assessment? There will be, uh, there'll be two tests, a midterm in a final. Um, and there will be uh, three assignments. I haven't yet, um, you know, wrote these assignments, but these assignments will be based upon specific questions about the international speakers that we've had. Just like in the summer abroad program, my assignments tended to be about the visits that we had um, in experiential learning courses like summer abroad in general. We want to connect what we see with academic material, what we experience with, what, with academic material. So what I'll probably do is I'll ask you to pick two out of the three for each of those three days and you'll have a specific question to answer about each of those presentations and that question will need to integrate information that you learn from the presentation with information that you can read by doing a lit review okay they'll be relatively short so i'm thinking a probably a couple of pages uh, but they they'll be very uh, concise and will need to demonstrate that integration of the knowledge from those two different sources thank you so much Stuart. i think that's all the questions for your course so we'll move on to our next instructor speaking and that will be tim sale tim when 
when you're ready, the floor is yours. Great, thanks so much. Hi everyone, uh, I wish I could see your faces, but I it's just the way we're doing things this year. So you can see mine, you can see my long hair. Hopefully by the time we meet again, I'll have got a haircut. I missed my chance uh, in summer 2020, so fingers crossed for 2021. I am really excited to be offering this course, The History of Modern Intelligence. We're offering it as a Y course for summer abroad. So we're doing the full year course in four weeks. This is a course that is usually, as I say, taught as an age, but often as a lecture course with hundreds of students. And so for the first time, this class is going to be offered sort of as a, a small class experience. So I'm really excited about that. We're going to focus on the history of the intelligence services of the great powers and the effects of their covert operations, their intelligence analysis, and decision-making on international relations in the 20th century. We're going to have a special focus on the UK, but it really is uh, intended to focus on several of the great powers. It just so happens that the British have actually declassified more of their documents than anyone else. They use their intelligence history as sort of soft power uh, in international affairs, and we'll talk about that in the course. So what I want to do now is quickly give give you an overview of the events and the chronological scope of the course, and then I'll speak quickly about how we're going to study these events in particular. So as I go here, that's just our little logo for the course. We're going to start in the end of the 19th century, in the, in the late 1800s, and think about both the military and the imperial origins of intelligence and the birth of these intelligence services, and really look at this amazing period at the beginning of the 20th century when spy scares and spy novels, fiction, actually helped create what are going to become MI5 and MI6 in the United Kingdom and think about sort of public opinion and how that shapes what happens in secret in governments. The First World War is our next, you know, sort of major moment. Some of the text isn't showing up here, but the question for the First World War is, is this the first intelligence war? And um, there's all sorts of major events and larger forces that shape the war that are directly connected to intelligence analysis intelligence operations. In between the wars, we have this enormous period of spy recruitment. And we have Russia and then the Soviet Union recruiting spies, like recruiting students at Cambridge University who are going to go on to spy on their allies during the Second World War and into the early Cold War. So we're going to look at the development of these espionage networks in peacetime. As we know, with the 20th century, it's not peace for very long before we return to war. And the Second World War is this other moment where all sorts of new intelligence techniques are developed and applied. We're going to think about the effect of double agents, the effect of ultra code breaking and signals intelligence. And, th and some people have actually claimed that the war would have been years longer if not for these developments in intelligence. And we're going to try and evaluate that claim. Um, moving on, we get into the Cold War, of course, and the espionage that occurs sort of during the Second World War and after. Igor Guzenko, a famous Canadian example of someone defecting. We're going to talk about mole hunts and ask whether it was paranoia for governments to spend so much time looking for moles and spies in their own nation's capitals. Something that happened in Canada for the whole Cold War, the search for moles who might have penetrated Parliament Hill and the government bureaucracies there. Now, this is a picture from the Cuban Missile Crisis of the, the missile sites that were discovered over Cuba by the U-2 surveillance flights. I want to spend some time in our course thinking about how covert operations during the Cold War actually helped create these nuclear crises during the Cold War. And, and think about the connection between sort of spying and skullduggery with the larger sort of nuclear weapons competition that occurred. And of course, we need to move into the early 21st century and think about how intelligence is shaping our world today. So that's the general bounds of the course, the, the general subjects we're going to touch on. Each one of those sort of baskets has all sorts of its own events and important moments within. So how are we going to study this stuff? In the last 10 years, the amount of primary documents that have been released, especially in the UK and the US, and by um, former Soviet agents has really exploded. And what's so crucial for us is that it's been so many of 
of these records have been scanned and made available online. So our, our virtual field trips, if you will, are going to be into the digital archives of some of these organizations. And I mean, it sounds counterintuitive because these are secret organizations, and yet they have shared a lot of secrets, not all of their secrets, but there's a lot of primary documentation that we can explore. And that's what I'm going to base this course around. The readings and our discussions are going to be based around reading real intelligence reports, operational plans and findings. And that's why the synchronous element of this course is so important. We're going to spend the, the mornings of our weeks together working through these documents. And then the afternoons would be sort of asynchronous time, not in class when you're preparing for the next day. So participation in those synchronous periods is really crucial and important. And we'll have some structured activities that will really allow for really active participation from everyone. You'll have some short writing assignments based on primary documents. The number of presentations you make will depend on the enrollment in the course, but uh, you'll have an opportunity to, to share some of the things you find. And finally, at the end of the course, we'll have a final assessment, probably a time-limited take-home type exam, which won't be a, a multiple choice exam, but rather an opportunity for you to put together a number of ideas from the course into one sort of analysis or very short essay on how you think intelligence shaped international relations in the 20th century. So I'll stop there and see if there's any questions. Thanks so much, Tim, for telling us more about your course. I'm just checking to see if there are any questions specifically, um, but I am curious to know if students need to have any particular background information or if they've had to take in courses, history courses to be prepared for this class. Sure, that's a really great question. Um, I think it would help if students had taken a history course or a political science course that explored the major events of the 20th century. But at the same time, I think the texts, uh, the secondary readings we're going to use to support the primary sources will help students really sort of situate what we're studying in the broader history. So students from all different disciplinary backgrounds are welcome. And then the course, I should just say, can count towards, in particular, obviously counts towards the history degree, but it can count towards the international relations major and specialist. And it also can count towards the new certificate in international affairs that's part of the U of T Global Scholars Program. Great, thank you. Uh, we do have one question from a student. What do intelligence briefings in this course entail? So, I mean, there'll be very clear instructions in the course, but that's the presentation component where you'll be um, briefing or making a presentation to the course about a particular element of uh, intelligence. So you're not expected to know what really what that means or, or how to do it, but it's something that we will, will model and discuss in class. It essentially means you'll be making a presentation based on some primary source intelligence material. And there's another question. Um, can this course be used as a social science distribution requirement? I believe you had answered that one as yes, uh, but I would say probably best to check with the registrars to make sure. Yeah, that's right. So I don't know if, because it usually counts as a, I think it might count as a human humanities distribution credit. So I think it would, I think it would be good to check with the registrar. I'm not sure if it counts as social science distribution. Here, there's one student who's very excited and wants to know how, as an applicant, um, they can stand out to be able to take this course. So we'll answer some more, we'll cover that content um, a little bit later in the session. Great. Great, thanks. Great, thanks so much, Tim. So we're going to move on to Catherine Williams' course, Topics in English for Shakespeare. So Catherine, when you're ready, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Um, hello, my name is Catherine Williams, and I'm I am a professor in the English department here at U of T, but I also work in theater and am very interested in thinking about early modern drama, so drama 16th and 17th century, in relation to questions both of text and performance. So this accounts for how the summer course is structured, which I'm very excited about. Let me see if I can advance the slides. Yes. Okay. Um, so for this course, each week, we are doing a deep dive into one play by Shakespeare. We will survey a variety of genres, so a comedy, Twelfth Night, a history play, Richard II, a tragedy, Macbeth, and a romance, which is kind of, kind of funky as a genre. This is actually not a distinction that is made in the first collected volume of Shakespeare's plays, which you see the image of, the 1623 folio, but this is a sort of subset of plays that come later, or it's a classification that arrives later. So as you can see, we're going to be thinking about both sort of the general question of the course, what's so great about Shakespeare, but also more specifically, for each play, we're going to be asking not only what is this play about, but how is this play 
made, which is to say that we're thinking through the rubrics of text and performance. So from the text perspective with each play that we read, we're, we'll be thinking about basic questions of literary analysis. How do we understand these plays? Um, we will read the text closely together. This accounts for the discussion elements of our synchronous course when we are working together with collective activities in large group and small group settings for a, a portion of the time together. We'll be thinking about how the text operate. We're thinking about terminology like genre, like dramatic character. And the goal of this is really to give you the tools for analysis of the single play, uh, but tools that are more broadly applicable to any other Shakespeare play or perhaps any other dramatic text that we read. Uh, but we'll also be thinking about this question of performance, how a play is made, because a play happens when, or Shakespeare's plays happen, when a group of actors come together and bring them to life. Even though we cannot go to these places physically together, we will be thinking quite a lot and working with filmed productions from the Globe Theatre in London, from the Royal Shakespeare Company Theatre in Stratford-upon-Avon. Um, I've given you just an image there of a production of Richard II that we will be watching that was at the Globe Theatre, not the outdoor version, but the indoor theatre, which is modeled on an indoor theatre called the Blackfriars, where Shakespeare's company performed. So we'll be thinking about the historical conditions of performance, right? What were these plays like when they were first performed, um, how does performance work? The goal there is also to give you tools to analyze and talk about and think about performance. So in addition to, and I'll, I'll say a little bit about virtual field trips in just a moment, um, but we'll have some guests come to the class who are Shakespearean actors and directors, and they'll talk about how they engage plays from this performance orientation. We are also in this class asking the question, um, a question about adaptation and institutions. So institutions in the sense that it's a, a question of how it is that Shakespeare's texts have survived for 400 years. So how were they collected and printed and reprinted over time? Um, and I've just given you images there on the top of the screen is the Bodleian Library at Oxford, which is an astonishing library. And then below that is the British Library in London. We will be working with them for virtual field trips. So even though we can't go, we'll take a look at some of their collections to think about how these texts are circulated and disseminated over time. And we'll also be thinking about adaptation, which is to say, how have Shakespeare's plays been transformed over time by remaking and reimagining? So I've given you two of the examples there. You see the Arab Shakespeare trilogy we're reading. So Kuwaiti English playwright Suleiman al-Bassam, we will be working with his adaptation called The Speaker's Progress, which is an adaptation of Twelfth Night. We will be reading Eleanor Brown's novel, The Weird Sisters, which is a novelized adaptation of Macbeth. For each of the plays that we're studying, we're studying not only the play, but also a range of performances, um, adaptations that sort of surround that. And then thinking about, uh, in addition to the institutions of theaters and libraries specifically, um, thinking about how these plays get remade over time. So I, I want to say a word about the assessments. And I also just want to note, I have mapped this course out around these four plays. The one thing that might change is that we are waiting to hear what may happen from the Globe and the Royal Shakespeare Company theaters in terms of their summer performance schedules. So typically this course taught in Oxford, we wouldn't know the plays until fairly late because we would read the plays that we would be going to see as a class at the theater. Since we have the flexibility because we won't be going to the theater, I've mapped this out, but there may be a last minute change if, depending on what happens with the programming. In other words, if we can sync it up with some kind of live show that is that it that happens at the Globe that is then being beamed around the world, um, we will do that. But it will still remain within the template, within the generic template that I've laid out here. Okay, and a word about assessment. Each week, 
you'll be writing one short writing exercise. Two of them will be based on textual analysis. Two of them will be based on performance analysis. So again, this is a way, these are very short assignments. They're asking you to think about the text that you read and to think about the productions that we watched uh, in order to make sense of what is happening with the play. So those are aimed at honing your writing skills as well as your facilities for textual and performance analysis. And then the final project for this, you have the option of writing because this is a 200 level English course, you have the option of writing a traditional research paper. You are welcome to do that, that builds on textual analysis. You also have an option, however, of doing a version of your own adaptation not an entire play. Uh, You can choose to work with a chunk, a scene from a Shakespeare play, one of the ones that we've studied, to develop your own adaptation using some of the techniques that we have, that we've talked about. So in that case, it's a creative final project of an adaptation and a position paper that explores the choices you've made. All right, I will pause there and perhaps see if there are any questions. Great, thank you so much, Catherine, for sharing more about your course. We have one question from a student saying that you're a great speaker, wants to know more about the um, courses that you teach at U of T, and I guess that could connect with um, if there's any sort of prerequisites or any course preparations for your course this summer. Yeah, um, so the other, the other courses that I teach at the U of T, I actually also work in disability studies. So I teach a freshman course on disability, but I also teach the 300 level drama courses that are about Shakespeare and his contemporaries. So what I will say is that this is a course that is designed to be introductory. In other words, you don't need to know anything about Shakespeare coming into this course. It is often hard to come into this course without knowing anything about Shakespeare, given the um, any English course that you may have taken prior to university. But this is designed to be both introductory, uh, but also because of the nature of the closely focused reading and analysis and the range of comparative production work. So as we look at multiple clips from different productions of a single play, if you have already taken a Shakespeare course or if you have some familiarity, I promise you there will be new things to learn. So the prerequisite for this is any English, it's, I think it's one credit of English courses. So, but those do not have to have been in Shakespeare. Um, And if you want to take this course with me and then take 300 level more advanced drama course that situates Shakespeare in relation to his contemporaries, you can do that moving into next term. Great. Thank you. We also have one fun question for you. If you could only ever see one Shakespeare play in your life, what would it be and who would be the lead? Uh, this, This question, I should have been ready for this because of course my answer is always situational, which is to say the play I want to see most is the play that I am seeing at the moment, right? But I will tell you that for this course, part of the reason we are doing these plays is because they are my favorite. And I I just flashed back to a memory. This decidedly does not answer your question. I'm going to refuse to choose about who the lead would be. Um, Although I will say that Benedict Cumberbatch Hamlet was pretty great. Uh, But there was an amazing production of Cymbeline with Patrick Page in the title role and Lily Robb. This was a Shakespeare in the Park production a couple of years ago that I attended. And it's an example of how a production can spark new questions about the play that you maybe didn't think to ask from just reading the play. So part of the reason we are doing Cymbeline is because I saw this great production several years ago. It sparked a couple of questions that I cannot get out of my head. Um, And so I am excited to think with you about the history of productions of Cymbeline and also about this astonishing, strange, messy, weird sort of magical play. Great, wonderful. Thank you so much, Catherine, for sharing more about your class. So we'll move on to our final speaker, last but not least. Dr. William Watson. Hey, thanks. Welcome, everyone. Let me just follow up on Professor Williams, the question asked of Professor Williams. Uh, I designed this course 
to require no prerequisites. And we take students from a whole range of uh, subjects, but including criminology and socio-legal studies. And the course is designed so that wherever you start from, it's either an introductory course, if you are unfamiliar with the material altogether, uh, or if you are a, a criminology and socio-legal studies student, you'll be able to work with that and move forward. And I would say that in my years of teaching the course, it's absolutely remarkable how students who have no background in criminology and socio-legal studies at the end of it are writing assignments of a very sophisticated level, understanding complex debates in our uh, subject. Uh, What we do in this course is to rely upon the historical fact that the origins of Canada's criminal justice system and uh, and criminal law lie in England, uh, the UK more broadly, but particularly in England. And so we, the course is designed to sort of start you with understanding the historical developments of criminal law and criminal justice processes in the UK over a period of time. And then we're able to get up to the rapidly get up to the point at which Canada is establishing its own system based upon the English system. Uh, And we can then look at divergences, ways in which the practices have become different, and also mutual influences in the current system systems where Canadian developments influence developments in, in England and the UK more broadly, and vice versa. So you get an overview both of the history and of the current practices where you're able to sort of see the differences and similarities between the two. Looking at this uh, slide here, someone asked Professor Kamenetsky about the question about synchronous lectures. So normally in this course, when I teach it in Oxford, we would be simply doing three-hour lectures Monday to Thursday, and I'm going to do that, but I'm intending to add sort of supporting asynchronous materials more than I would obviously normally, so that you'll be able to connect back with some online materials that you can look at uh, or listen to at any one time as you go through. So we're going to, as other courses are, virtual tours, and we're going to do those three sections, three of those. First one, we'll go to a virtual tour of the British Museum and a virtual tour of the Tower of London. The following week, we're going to do a virtual tour of the Museum of London, which is a fantastic resource, which is uh, the Museum of London is a historical museum that's organized chronologically and allows you to sort of start prehistoric, pre-Roman times and sort of move through the museum up to the present day. So we'll be able to do that virtually. And we're also going to do a virtual Jack the Ripper walk. Jack the Ripper was a serial killer from the late 19th century. And there's lots of rather complicated, interesting aspects to the story there. And of course, it's a very well-known story. Many would have heard of it. No one's finally identified who that person was. But there's lots of interesting aspects about social life at that time, uh, policing at that time. And then the following week, I'm going to have organized a sort of virtual visit to London where we look at sites of political violence in London, because London has a history of political violence from the earliest days right up to the present day where serious acts of political violence have occurred. And so to understand the sort of historical spread of that is very important. I also, as you'll see on this slide, I'm going to create some special materials about British history and culture, because even though this course isn't entirely historical by any means, and a lot of it's about the current situation, I do want students to be able to understand that history, historical development that gets us up to the present. And I think that when you're in Oxford, for instance, or you're in England and moving around, it, it's relatively easier to get a sense of that history. But I want to recreate that with a number of online materials I'm going to create. So that we'll do a brief visual history of British architecture, a brief oral or sound history, of British music, a brief visual history of British sport, a very uh, all of these running across the time frame. And for those of you interested, I'm going to put together a small recipe book of uh, history of British food uh, starting in medieval times and coming up to the present. And I think all of these things help you to understand the developments we're talking about, even though they're not directly about it. To have a sense of what the world was like at the different times we're talking is very, very helpful. We cover quite a number of topics. We talk about the criminal law, we talk about constitutional law, we talk about policing, we talk about questions in a little bit covering security uh, and secrecy, we talk about some recent changes and developments in the UK in policing and in the criminal law, and then we look at a a couple of areas where Canada has been especially influential in the UK that have to do with the operation of women's prisons, and also the concept of the psychopath uh, is something which uh, in which Canada has had a strong influence on a practices in the UK. So we get to look at a very wide range of topics. Uh, We also look a a bit about the history of criminology 
in the UK and Canada too. And in terms of the assignments, all of the assignments are small essay form assignments. So this is a particularly good course for people wanting to work on their writing skills. It's sort of designed to accomplish that. And again, it doesn't matter whether you're a, a very good essay writer, perhaps knowledgeable a bit about criminology, or someone who is worried about their essay writing and knows nothing about criminology. Uh, I'm going to work with you from wherever you start to take you forward. And I can promise you that you will improve from wherever you start in, in a considerable degree. Part of the course is organized around a great many, great many office hours. And on top of the office hours, which occur Monday to Thursday, more or less daily and on Sundays, along with the office hours, we'll have specific appointment times to talk about a term paper you're going to write, which is quite short. And it's going to be on a topic you'd picked up in the course, but it could be on another topic. We'll talk if there's something you're interested in writing about that's not on the course, but we can relate to the course themes. I'm happy to accommodate that. And so you're all going to meet with me for 15 minutes online in with through appointments to talk about that. So there's lots of opportunities to engage one-on-one -on -one or in office hours, maybe you, two of you would come along at the same time and talk about uh, your work. Uh, some students on this course make a lot of use of that and come along to a lot of the office hours. Uh, it's all part of the process of of, uh, creating a better and better writing for you by the end of the course. So Jennifer, I think I'll leave it there at the moment. Okay, great. Thank you so much, William. Let me just take a quick peek and see if there are any specific questions. So we have one question here. Since there is no denoted CRIM course at UTM, could this course count towards the CRIM sociology major? Like the others, I think the answer to that is I can't be sure you would have to ask there. I've had students take the course from both UTSC and uh, Mississauga who are wanting to use it as criminology courses. So I haven't had feedback from them that there's a problem, but I think you'd better check there. There's another question about just um, whether or not it counts as a history or sociology distribution. I think, again, that probably would be something to check with the registrars. It, and It's breadth three. Breadth three, so, okay. But, but in terms of whether it could count for a, no, not a distribution, but whether it could count in a program, I, that, that would be a decision that they make, but it counts as breadth three. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I think that's all the questions for the... For you, William, thank you so much for sharing more about your course. Thank you. Okay, I think at this point, we will move on and I'll ask Genevieve to continue on with our session today. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. So now we're going to move on to technical aspects of how you can actually do a summer abroad. So in terms of who is eligible, so it's open to all U of T students and U of T alumni as well. So if you've, even if you're um, finishing up your degree now, you can still do it in the summer as an extra credit if you wanted to. You must be in good academic standing and have completed at least one term of study by the time that you apply. You also need to have a minimum CGPA of above 1.75. The courses are also open to visiting students. So every year when we're doing our courses abroad, we usually do have a handful of students from other Canadian universities who might join us. So if you do have friends at other um, schools who might be interested in doing one of these courses with you, they can also apply. It's actually a very simple process and we'd be happy to walk them through that. So in terms of applying, the applications are now open. You can log into the application through our website and you have until March 1st to apply. So participants will be selected on a set of criteria, not on a first come first serve basis. So we do an assessment of everyone's individual application when we're assigning spots. So one thing we consider is academic suitability, of course, so we do look at your CGPA. We look to see that you meet any prerequisites if there are any, but we also pay a lot of attention to your personal statement. We want to encourage you to really work on that. It's not just sort of a generic uh, statement that, that you can say. In fact, I mean, sometimes we get applications where the student has a really great CGPA, but they write one sentence for their personal statement and it, it really holds them back. So definitely uh, make sure that you're explaining in your personal statement why you want to do the program, how it fits with your academic interests, your personal interests, really make a good case for what you could bring to the course and um, what you would get out of it as well. And we do give you some guidelines. So part of the, um, when you get to the personal statement in the application, we give you four or five things that we want you to address in your statement. Um, there is a $200 application fee, which you pay after you've finished your application, you pay your fee and then you submit it. And once the application fee is paid, and your application is submitted, then we're able to access it and do the assessments. If you are not selected for the program, 
you will be refunded your $200 application fee. So you have nothing to lose by applying. You can apply for up to two summer abroad courses, but they can't be overlapping. So because they're such intensive courses and the classes happen at the same time, you could only do say one at the beginning of the summer and one later on in the summer if you wanted to. Also within the program, because England has multiple courses, you can rank your first choice and your second choice of courses that you want to take within the program. And this is what the application looks like. It's very straightforward. Once you log in, you'll be brought to the application page. You'll select the course that you want, and then you go on to fill in your personal statement. And then we give you information for you to read about the refund policy and other disclosures. Then you'll review your application, pay your application fee, and then submit. So it actually, if you if you have your personal statement done ahead of time, doing the actual application and submitting it on the website is actually a pretty quick process. Now in terms of accepting an offer, so we will start evaluating the applications after the deadline on March 1st, and we'll be sending out notifications starting in late March and early April. So depending on which summer abroad program you're applying to, you will hear at different times whether you've been accepted. So if you have a friend who applied to another program and they've already heard, don't worry, we will get back to everyone and we let you know if you were accepted or if you weren't. Um, at that point, you'll have one week to confirm your participation, and you do that by paying a non refundable $500 deposit, which is part of your overall course fee. If at this point, if you decline an offer and you've been offered a spot, then you would not get your application fee returned. And the remaining fees for the program are due roughly four weeks after the deposit. And again, that will vary um, depending on the program. We'll give you all this information again, once you're accepted to the program, we provide you with all the dates that you're gonna need, exactly how much you'll need to pay, all of that will be provided to you. So in terms of the costs, so the costs for the virtual summer abroad programs are slightly different from on-campus courses. You have a $200 application fee. There's also the course fee, 1,600 for domestic students, 2,755 for international students. And again, that includes the $500 deposit that you would have paid when you accepted your offer. And that includes all the costs of the virtual field trips that are a part of the course. In addition to that, there's the U of T incidental fees. So those aren't paid to the summer abroad office. Those are paid on ACORN and they will show up when we register you in the course on ACORN, then the incidental fee will appear on your ACORN account and you will have to pay that as well. So in terms of financing your summer abroad, so final payments will be due in April and May. Again, the dates will vary depending on the program. Now for the virtual programs, unfortunately the summer abroad bursaries are not available. So in normal years, um, we do have funding for the summer abroad programs. Um, because those funds are earmarked specifically for international travel, um, we won't be able to provide them for this year's programs. But we do want to encourage you to check with your registrar's office for other possible awards and bursaries. Um, I know from speaking to students that many of the colleges do have funds available for specific summer programs. So definitely check with the financial aid advisor at your own college about that. The courses are also eligible for OSAP. So if you're currently on fall winter OSAP, then what you'd be applying for would be the summer extension. That usually grants about $375 per week for the duration of the program. So that can really help offset your costs. One thing to note about OSAP though, is that they don't actually release the funds until the start date of the program. And our fees are due well before then. So you would still have to finance your summer abroad fees without the OSAP. So just um, a brief time timeline of um, what to expect. So we're already in February. We're doing the um, information sessions at this time of year. March 1st is the application deadline. Late March, early April, you'll hear from us if you got in. And then as mentioned, there's a $500 deposit due a week after that. And then remaining fees due in April and May. So that's about it for the, the presentation of the virtual summer abroad program in England. Do, I think we have some time for some questions, if there are any. Okay, so one question, um, how can an applicant stand out for selection? Um, so again, really make sure that you're uh, making a case in your personal statement for, you know, why, how the course fits into your academic goals, your personal goals. You don't have to have a lot of experience within the course subject area. You don't have to sort of show that you've already have a background in it. It, but just to show that you have a genuine interest in the course material, in the location as well, uh, and just to pay attention to your personal statement. Will these course courses be offered next year in England with the same instructor? Some of the courses will be, but we often do change some of the courses around. So at this point, we can't guarantee that the same courses will be offered. It is, it is sort of likely. The time that we usually make the decisions for the following year 
would be towards the end of the summer. So check back with us in the fall about what will be offered next year, which will hopefully be in England. And we expect some of the same courses to be offered. I see there's one question here from a student. Can one personal statement serve as uh, serve two applications within one program? So if you're applying for two different programs, um, you will have to submit a personal statement for each program. One thing to note is that we do assess the the um, the personal statements on uh, separately in terms of looking at the programs. I would recommend tailoring your personal statements for the course and the program that you're applying for. Um, that way it helps to kind of get a better idea of why you're interested in those programs. If you're going to use the same statement for all the programs and courses you're applying for, we don't really get a lot of information from you as to exactly why you're interested in those particular programs. So that's a tip for you just to think about tailoring your personal statements for the course and the program you're looking at applying for. And there's another question. I was thinking of applying to two different programs to two countries. Would that mean I have to pay $500 in application fees? And if I were to get accepted to both and I reject one and stay in the other, would I lose $200? No, if you apply for two summer abroad programs um, and you get into both of them, if you do decide to take the spot in one and you decline the second one, we would refund your $200 application fee for the program that you're not doing as long as you are doing one of the programs. There's one question here around how many people get accepted. So again, we try to keep our each course between 18 to 30 students just to have the small classroom experience so you can really immerse yourself into the course with your classmate. Uh, so that's sort of the gauge of um, how many students we have we accept per course. So we do have four courses available for the England program. Each course would likely be ranging between 18 to 30 students. And then there's one question here. Do we have to reapply if we were accepted to a course last year? So for students who applied for a summer abroad last year, unfortunately we had to cancel because of the pandemic. You, you will have to reapply again for our virtual courses this year, but we do take into consideration that you were accepted into a program last year. And uh, there's another question is history three 343Y a BR1? I believe it is a BR1, but actually if you check on our website, you'll see the course description and it will list it. And I don't have access to that at the moment, but I, I believe that it's BR1. Are there any other questions? What does BR mean? It means breadth requirement. So I think um, it, that's for at the St. George campus, they call it breadth requirements and they're in a numbered system. That's different at some of the other campuses. So it's sort of, uh, it's, it's a category of courses. And I believe they're also called distribution requirements at other campuses. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, if you do think of some questions, and I'm sure you will, definitely don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Um, we're all very accessible right now. Um, you can reach us by phone. You can reach us by email. Um, and if you go to our website, you can arrange to meet with one of us, um, have a virtual meeting if you want to talk a little bit more in depth about the program. So definitely get in touch. We're here to give you all the information that we can. And yeah, so I think there are no more questions. I think that um, brings us to the end of our session today. So thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time and we really appreciate your interest in doing a virtual summer abroad program. And we hope that you'll go through and apply for one. Also, thank you to our professors who joined us today and shared all the information about their interesting courses. I think we all really learned a lot from the profs today. And yeah, so again, if you have any questions, feel free to get in touch. And thanks for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of your day and take care.